So the idea is really that, well, you can automate your own work, obviously. Uh, you can save workflows that you use yourself, but you can also keep the workflow file. It's just a text file, actually. Um, so you can give it to somebody else who is using Chipster, and then that somebody else can, can run it uh, for his or her own data. So in, in some uh, laboratories, they use it so that if there is somebody in the research group who is very knowledgeable, uh, with bioinformatics, then that person prepares the workflow and then the other people can, can run it. And, and that way the principal investigator knows that at least something consistent has happened with the data. Uh, of course, the others can then <clears throat> do their own analysis as, as well, but it's, it's just one way to sort of standardize things a little bit. And just to remind you how we put it to run. So like in my uh, screen here, I have several steps. This is now microarray data, but the idea is exactly the same. So let's say that I would want to save all the steps starting from this point. So I would be going down and doing all these things. So to save the workflow, importantly, you select the beginning point of it. So in my case, it's this file up here. Because the common, I'm just sort of repeating myself, because the common mistake is that people go and, and select all the files. So basically, like all the steps they want to include. But no, it's, it's only the beginning. And then it, it's able to figure out from there what, what you have done after that point. And of, of course, the workflow can start from anywhere. So we, we started it today from the fastq file, but, but it could even uh, equally well start from something, a, a, a later step, like this step here would be fine too, or, or this one. And once you have saved it uh, from up here, uh, then when you come to, to run it, you have actually two options. So today uh, I showed you this option, run recent, because we are now saving the workflow as we work. But if you are, um, if you get a workflow file from someone else, you would copy the file somewhere on your computer, and then uh, you go to this uh, run option, and it allows you to navigate uh, to that file. So it's, it's quite simple, really. So in our case now, we had two samples. You normally would have much more. Um, but for each of these samples, you would do these steps that we have done until now. So you would have aligned them. Well, you would have checked the quality, uh, done some trimming if it seemed necessary, aligned them, and counted them. And so what, what you, you end up with a lot of individual count files. So there is going to be a count file for each sample. Now what we are going to do in the next step is we select all these files. And in Chipster you can do it so that you keep the control key down to select some, several files. And, and, and then we run a tool called, uh, it, it's in the utilities category, and it's called define uh, NGS experiment. So that will then combine all your count files into just one big table, like, like what you see here. So I have all my samples and counts for each gene in all these samples. So you get a table, but now importantly, in addition to this count table, you get another file, uh, which is called phenodata file. And it looks a bit different in the workflow view. It doesn't look like a box, but it's more like a, a little sort of a ball. And it's attached to the count table. So this means that this file actually contains information uh, for the experiment. So for the samples that are listed in the count table. So it has a specific function in Chipster. And uh, 
when when you open it to look at it, you will see that there are various columns ready made for you. But then you can also add columns, and you are free to add as ever many columns you need to to describe your experiment. So, but I, I will just point out some important columns, and the most important one is the group column, which is there already to start with. So this is where you describe to Chipster which sample is a control sample, which one is a treatment sample, and you know whatever your experimental setup is like. So if you have more than two groups, you just give more numbers. So basically, the the samples that belong to the same group get the same number here. And we strongly advise you to use numbers rather than uh, text in this column uh, because the statistical tools use this column and they will, um, among other things, calculate fold change values. So you want those fold changes to cal be calculated the right way around. So that, for example, if you get a positive fold change, it means that in your treatment group the expression is higher. So uh, use numbers and in such a way that you always use a smaller number for the control group. Because uh, so if, if you wrote text here, say your samples were or your groups were control and cancer, that would work. Chipster wouldn't complain about it, but it would calculate the fold chains the wrong way around because it would just take those words alphabetically and cancer CA is before control, which is CO. So, so that's why to be on the safe side, it's, it's better to use numbers here. Of course, uh, you are most welcome to write extra columns for yourself to remember. So like here, in my case, my uh, um, my groups are my treatments, so control treatment and a DPN, a chemical treatment. So this is just for myself to remember what the numbers are. Um, then in this particular example, I have also samples from several um, cancer patients actually. So I have three different patients, and I might want to take that information into account later on in the statistical testing. So I have marked the samples that come from the same patient with the same number. And um, finally, in my case here, I also have a bit of a time cost. So the samples were treated uh, with uh, with either control or, or the chemical for 24 or 48 hours. So essentially I have two different time points. And now again I just use numbers to indicate this. So I have sort of bint this into two uh, bins. But of course depending on your experiment you create the columns that, that you need. The most important thing is to use numbers here. Then I want to point out this other column, which also has a special meaning, so the description column here. And this uh, column, which is titled description, is what is used for the, um, for the plots. So when you make um, images for publication, for example, you probably don't want to have like just file names there for the samples, but you want to name them some other way. So it's in this description column, what you write there will appear in your, um, in your images that you create in GIST. When you are doing these things with real data, then especially the alignment step with top hat will take several hours. So, you know, you don't want to be sitting around and waiting for it. And, or you also don't want to keep chips to open for all that time, most likely. So, um, what you can do when you have really long jobs is you start the job as normal. 
uh, then you check in the bottom panel, you go to this view jobs. Uh, oops, okay, well, I don't have any jobs there now because I'm using a ready-made session here. But anyway, so you would uh, have a look at the status of the job that you have launched. Um, so at first it will say transferring inputs. But when that is over, that means that the data is already on the server and it's ready to run. So when it says running, at that point, you can just save the session in Chipster and close the, close the session. And, and that's fine. So then when you come next time, you open that session and, and you know, your results are, are probably there. So it's, 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 there is no need to keep Chipster open all the time for those long jobs. 